Okay, so my goal today is to try uh, looking at an example uh, of, a, of a family of discrete groups in, in PU21 and trying to give you uh, an idea uh, of how it works from, from A to Z. So I'm not giving you any general theory, mostly because there is none yet. <laughs> Maybe one of you are going, is going to develop it. Uh, so, uh, okay. So here is. Uh, so we were already in the second part of of the talk, and I started the the, the second talk at the end of the first talk, and so this is the second part of the second part of the of of the whole thing. <laughs> so. Let me call this a nice example. And that will be complex, hyperbolic, ideal triangle groups. So before Moving to the complex hyperbolic thing, maybe I should just uh, do the classical ideal triangle group. So uh, the classical case, as you will see, it's fairly simple. So what do we do? So we take an ideal triangle in the usual Poincaré disk. So here it is. And as I was saying yesterday, uh, up to isometry, there is only one such thing. So we have an ideal triangle, and so I have uh, three geodesics. It's ugly. M my drawing is very bad. Probably you will do something better. Sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 are the reflections about the three geodesics. Okay? And... Uh, well, as a matter of fact, the group generated by sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 uh, is discrete. So it is discrete inside the group of isometries of the Poincaré disk and isomorphic to the free product of three copies of z over 2z. Okay? So, before going any further, let's make sure that we, we understand this. How can we prove such a thing? What would you do? Well, let's make a, a, a puzzle. What you need is an activity uh, which is very re recreat re recreative. Yeah? I know some of you are quite talented and for that. And if you do this barefoot, then you get blisters. That's what happened to me if you're, you're not used to it. That's not badminton. That's the other one. Ping pong. Okay. So we're going to apply the ping pong lemma. Okay. And from this, we can... Uh, I know some of you are quite good at this, right? I think we can say that Jack Titz preferred... Uh, ping pong uh, to badminton because otherwise you would have named it badminton lemma. Okay, so what, what's what's this ping pong lemma? So we take a, a a point here inside the triangle, and then we take a small ball around it, which is contained inside the triangle. So that's an open triangle, and then we hit it with a racket. And what is the racket? So the racket is a word in sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. And, well, let's look at this. If you, if you apply, say, for instance, sigma 1 to this yellow ball, then sigma 1 exchanges that half of the, of the space with that, that half of the space. Okay? So if I apply sigma 1, this yellow ball here comes here. Then if I apply any of the other two guys, it's going to come back here or come back here, depending on... And what you see if you iterate this process is that if you apply 
a word, say sigma one, sigma three, sigma two, something like that, to the yellow ball. Then the yellow ball never comes back inside the triangle. Uh, Delta will be this triangle. Okay? Yes? Oh, sorry. But yeah. um, well, that's a, you need to think about it for, a, for five minutes, and you will see that there is no big mystery here. So this is a, somehow a geometric or topologic version of the, of the ping-pong lemma. But that's something you can, you can write statements that are more general and that they give you free groups in groups uh, as a general. Here we have a bit more because we have an action here. And what can we say? So the yellow ball here, well, if it never comes back, then its center and none of its points can be a fixed point of no point in the group. But if this means that no element in the group has a fixed point inside, so no element is elliptic, and so the group is discrete. Okay, so that's a well, that's a, a, a simple way of proving discreteness. This this ping pong lemma. Okay, there is an alternative which is using something called the Poincaré polyhedron theorem, which is much more complicated. Okay, and. Uh, well, in that case, that wouldn't be too bad, but in general, it's uh, much more involved. So I only want to do a simple thing. So delta is a discontinuity region. Uh, more precisely, I think we can say that for all gamma in sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, Gamma applied to delta never intersects delta. And that makes the group discrete. OK. Um, if you're looking for a precise statement of the uh, ping pong lemma, well, you can check, for instance, Radcliffe's Uh, hyperbolic geometry book. So that's probably a statement which is adapted to hyperbolic geometry. You can also go to Wikipedia, it's okay, it works. Uh, okay, so now let's move to the complex hyperbolic case. So what do we have? Well, again, I'm going to take, this is the complex hyperbolic space, and I take an ideal triangle, so three points on the boundary, and then for each pair uh, that I can produce, we have a complex line connecting them. So again, I'm drawing in perspective in, in, in 4Ds, so that's bad. Okay, but these three yellow things are the mirrors, uh, sorry, are the complex line connecting, so what's my notation? P1, P2, P3, and I'm going to call the, the reflections I3, so that's the reflection about that guy. This is going to be I1, and this one is going to be I2. And the question is, so this is a complex ideal triangle group. So uh, question, when is uh, I1 
I2, I3, discrete and isomorphic to the free product of three copy of Z over 2Z. When is this true? So, uh, as you remember, yesterday, uh, uh, well, I'm going to state it as a proposition, sorry. So, yesterday we said that the uh, ideal triangles were classified by a, a single real invariant, which was Carton invariant, which you could see either projectively or using the Keller form. So, here is a proposition. Uh, so, the set of conjugacy classes of ideal triangle group is, uh, well, the range of the Cartan invariant. So, minus pi over 2, pi over 2. So, I should say that this question here was first raised by uh, Bill Goldman. Pretty sure many of you heard his name. And um, he was giving a course in the early 90s uh, about complex hyperbolic geometry while I wasn't there. I was too young. I was even mathematically born. But I've, I think he's traumatized a whole generation of American mathematicians. <laughs> because every time I meet someone who was at that course, it t he tells me, that was terrible. <laughs> was, of, of not meaning anything bad, of course, but they're saying complex hyperbolic geometry is just a mess. <laughs> okay, so I'm trying to give you a, a way through this. Uh, okay. Okay, so the proof... We, we've done it ex essentially yesterday uh, by classifying uh, ideal triangles because once you have classified ideal triangles, then you have, uh, you have your group. Okay? And uh, uh, so here is the question. I can uh, rephrase it. We have a one parameter family of groups. So uh, questions rephrased. for which values of A uh, is sigma 1. Well, let me call this group gamma A discrete and isomorphic to Z over 2Z. Okay, so, well, we hope that there is at least one such value. So here are a few uh, uh, remarks. The first one is that we know at least one point where this cannot be true. This is when the three points here, P1, P2, and P3, belong to a common complex line. If you choose three points, that lie in a common complex line, then because there is only one complex line containing two points, then these three complex lines are actually only one. And so the group is just Z over 2Z. Okay? So if uh, P1, P2, P3 are in a common complex line, which means A equals pi over 2 plus minus, then gamma pi over 2 is isomorphic to Z over 2Z because the 3 uh, I1 equals I2 equals I3. Okay? The 3... This, if these three points are in a common complex line, well, because there is only one complex line containing two points, then you have no choice. It's three times the same. 
Now, second, what happens, so this is the next specific value of, of the Cartan invariant, what happens if A equals zero? So that, that is, uh, if P1, P2, P3 belong to uh, uh, a real plan. Okay, so this is, uh, we can take just H2R. Okay, so what happens? To understand the situation there, what we need is to see uh, what happens if I take uh, two points, P and Q, and what I've just drawn here is a real plane containing them. Okay, so this is a real plane, and there is only always uh, such one. Now I look at the geodesic connecting them, and P and Q also belong to a complex line. So I'm going to draw it on the on the figure. So it's something like this, and this is a complex line. So what's the intersection between the complex line and the real plane? Well, it's the geodesic, because we have two uh, totally geodesic subspace. Both of them should contain the geodesic, and because the intersection of two uh, totally geodesic things is totally geodesic, then it has to be the geodesic. So uh, the intersection is that geodesic. So this is H2R intersected with the complex line. Oh, yesterday I was denoting this PQ upper C. And uh, so what do I need? So what happens when I apply the reflection? So the reflection, oh, sorry, reflection about PQC preserves H2R and its restriction is the geodesic symmetry. So you have this complex line and this real plane that intersect, and the reflection about the yellow complex line preserves the real plane and the geodesic. So it exchanges the two, the two components. Okay, so it's the, it's the symmetry. So that's good for us, because if we have this, that can analyze the action of this group in the case where the three points are in, the, in a real plane. So let me do that. Well, it's, it's drawn here, in fact. So, if I have... So, this is going to be H2C. Inside H2C, I'm going to draw H2R. And inside H2R, I have an ideal triangle. I need more colors because otherwise it's get, it will get messy very soon. So here is our ideal triangle. And now I'm saying that uh, this is, so I should have, um, sorry, okay, above each of these lines, Okay, now I'm reaching the limits of uh, faulty drawing, okay? Because each of these red geodesics is the intersection of Li with H2R. Yes? Li is the complex line uh, corresponding to this geodesic here and there. Yes? And so because all of them preserve the real plane, then the action on the real plane is just like in the classical case. 
And what can we do if we want to prove that this again is a discrete group in the higher dimension uh, H2C? Well, we can just play ping pong in 4D here. And what are going to be the... We, we had before uh, three half spaces that were uh, defined by geodesics. Here, I'm just going to take the inverse. Uh, I can just take the... Okay, I have my 4D problem again. But I'm taking the inverse image of each of these geodesics by the orthogonal projection onto H2R. And this gives me what I need. So... I have three hypersurfaces. Uh, okay, this one is difficult to draw. Let me do it like this. I have three hypersurfaces, and uh, they, this triangle here. So, so I, okay, um, I have some a prism actually. I have this triangle above each point of the boundary of this triangle. I have a fiber of the projection onto H2R, and this defines a prism, okay? And the sides of these prisms serve to define half spaces, and I can play ping pong like that. Uh, the yellow ball. Oh yes, the, if I put a, a, small, a small yellow ball here, well, uh, it has, to, uh, if I take, okay, where's my, okay, yellow is too far. So the ball is going to become white. Okay, if I take a small disk here inside H2R, because the group is preserved, then this disk is going to stay inside H2R. And yeah, it preserves H2R. Okay, so it's just, I'm, what I'm doing is embedding the usual ideal triangle group into the stabilizer of a real plane. ITG for ideal triangle group into the stabilizer of H2R, like that. Okay, so now it is going to start getting messy because we are going to deform, okay? So here, to describe this, this ping pong, uh, well, we used the projection onto this totally geodesic subspace, and this you always have. But if I deform, then the three vertices of my triangle will no longer be in a, in a, in a totally geodesic subspace, so I will lose, I will miss uh, the projection. Okay, so what can we do? So before saying anything, maybe I should state uh, a theorem. So, theorem, where is the theorem? So I was saying that Bill Goldman traumatized a whole generation of people with his course. There are at least two people who were not traumatized, and I'm going to name them now. So the theorem is due half to Goldman and Parker, and the other one is Rich Schwartz. Uh, so there exists uh, a subinterval uh, minus alpha zero alpha zero in minus pi over two pi over two, such that uh, gamma a. is discrete and isomorphic to what we want if and only if A belongs to minus alpha zero, alpha zero. 
So the set of good ideal triangle groups is actually a closed symmetric subinterval. And well, in fact, uh, Bill Goldman and John Parker proved the partial uh, uh, result and uh, conjectured this theorem that was proved later by, uh, by Rich Schwartz. So where does this subinterval come from? So that's a remark. Well, um, what we are saying yesterday is that uh, if there are no elliptics, uh, the group is discrete. Well, here, in fact, uh, this interval will be defined by only one element becoming el uh, elliptic. So that's what I'm going to say now. So uh, A, the Cartan invariant, is strictly less than alpha zero if and only if uh, the triple product I1, I2, I3 is loxodromic. So I don't know if it was very clear from my lecture yesterday, but loxodromic is just the same thing as hyperbolic in the real hyperbolic space. Okay. Uh, A equals alpha zero if it don't leave, it is parabolic. And it is larger than an alpha zero if and only if this is elliptic. Okay? So, just one remark. If um, I1, I2, I3 is elliptic, and Gamma A discrete. Well, the, the theorem is saying it doesn't happen. Okay? But if it were to happen, then I1, I2, I3 would have to be to have finite order. Because it's, uh, it, it lives on a, in a compact subgroup. And so if it has infinite order, then you have accumulation points. Then I1, I2, I3 uh, has to have a finite order. And if it has finite order, the representation is unfaithful. And so, uh, sorry, I should say, uh, gamma A uh, is not isomorphic to Z over 2Z. Yes? And it's true, of course, for any uh, element in the group. If at some point you, you have a, an element that becomes of torsion, then the, the other than one of the three generators, then the group can't be the free product of, of three copies of Z2 over, uh, Z over 2Z. OK, so now. What did they do to, to do some, to, you, you need to be able to, to do something. So first, okay, you really have to, to put your hands into the dirt to, to do this. And so maybe I would just like to give you a, a quick idea about what happens close to A equals to zero. Giving you the whole story is far, is far too complicated because it's very technical. But let me just show you something. I'm going to draw the beginning of the proof. So let's go back for a minute to the ideal, the classical ideal triangle group. So if I look, so this is our triangle, delta, and this is its image under this reflection here. Now I'm claiming that the two diagonals of this triangle are orthogonal. This is a not too difficult an exercise. And what happens is that in the complex hyperbolic space, it remains true. So 
it remains true, whatever the value of, of the Cartan invariant. So let me just draw a similar picture as this, only with uh, potatoes. So I'm going to draw first and then label things, otherwise I will not be able to do it. You mean the yellow thing? <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Then I. I... <laughs> Thanks for being honest. <laughs> okay, so, okay, I claim this is more or less the same picture as what's there. <laughs> okay, where is the ideal triangle group? Well, this is going to be I1. I2, I3. So we have here an ideal triangle. This is, of course, schematic. There's no, no, geometry, no geometry in there. And here we have the images of the, this complex line and other reflection in the yellow one. So the associated uh, uh, reflections are the conjugates by I1 of this guy. So that's I. 1, I2, I1, and this is, no, that's the other, that's 3. And that's I1, I2, I1. Okay, and what uh, Bill and John did is playing ping pong with these four guys instead of the first two. So the principle is that if you take a finite index subgroup, then the mirrors are further away, and so it leaves you more room to construct uh, a ping pong domain. So let me just explain the principle. So uh, idea, construct three, uh, four hypersurfaces, that are stable by, well, I2, I3, I1, I3, I1, and I1, I2, I1. Okay? So this is easier Then for I1, I2, I3, because the mirrors are further away. So yesterday, I've just said a word about what bisectors were. This is what they take as a as wall for their ping pong domain. Okay? So it's, I would be happy to be able to convince you that it's not too complicated. However, I know I will not be able to do that right now. But eventually, uh, the, whole, the whole point in their paper is to notice, oh, I won't say that, sorry. <laughs> But it, really, the, 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 the main inequality is something like uh, the diagonal of the square is root 2, which is an equality, but it's, it's a thing which is really elementary, only you have to figure out what happens in, in, in 4D. Okay? So, well, this is not a very good, uh, maybe not a very good advertisement for their... For their 
for their method. But uh, it's, it's really something that, that is accessible. Okay. Sorry? Well, that's the point. That's a good point. That's a problem. In complex hyperbolic geometry, when you want to prove that a group is discrete, unless you know that it's discrete for some reason, like if it's contained in an arithmetic subgroup, then you have to prove it. You have to construct a fundamental domain or you have to apply some ping pong. And it's always a bit of a technical thing to do. And I know, I don't know any other method for doing this. There is probably. It's highly non-unique. I mean, the, probably you can derive your, your own method. But, uh, uh, well, okay. Uh, okay, that's what I'm going to say. So I would like to, to now move on to the, to the last ideal triangle group. So the one for which uh, we have parabolic element. So three. The last ideal triangle group. It sounds a bit like a, a Western movie title. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Okay, so uh, let me just come back to the usual ideal triangle. Uh, so that's the classical ideal triangle. And so we have two. I'm, again, I'm taking, or oh, this, my, my drawings are getting worse. Uh. So again, I'm taking delta, the same as we had before, and it's image under sigma one. So we have delta and we have sigma one of delta. And now I'm saying that each of these two triangles has a symmetry of order three. So meaning there is an isometry that cyclically permutes these three elements. So I'm going to call this one uh, that's not the right uh, I'm going to call the right one S and I'm going to call the left one T okay and now so here I had P1 P2, P3. Let us take a look at the product of S and T. So ST, if I apply it to P1, look at what happens. So P1 moves to P3. Uh, sorry, I should take TS. Uh, uh -huh. uh, okay, ST. Okay, if I take ST, okay, sorry, uh, ST, so if I take P3, P3 is mapped to P1 by T, and then S maps it back to P3. So ST of P3 is equal to P3. If you do the same, TS of P1 is equal to P1, and these two guys are actually parabolic. Okay, and well, here, uh, 
as you can see, I've mixed my notations between the board and, and my paper. That's bad. Uh, so P2 is mapped to P1 by S, and then is mapped Uh, okay, anyway, what happens is that if you take uh, delta modulo st and ts, what you get is a three punctured sphere. Uh, okay, and in that group generated by s and t, uh, if you look at sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 squared, then this is the same thing as the commutator of, uh, sorry, as the cube of T inverse S. Okay? And this is the same thing, this is conjugate to the commutator of ST and TS. Okay. Uh, well, that's a, take it as an exercise. Okay, and what this shows here, if you believe that this is a three-punctured sphere, this commutator here represents a loop on the three-punctured sphere, and therefore it is a loxodromic map. Because the only parabolic maps on, the, on a three-punctured sphere are the peripheral loops, and this is not one. So, this one is loxodromic. Well, hyperbolic in the in the Fuchsian case. Okay. So I've said what I wanted on this. So what happens? The last ideal triangle group. In the last ideal triangle group A's, then what we have, we said, is that I1, I2, I3 uh, is parabolic. Okay? So if I go back here, to my ideal triangles, well, we still have an order three symmetries of the two ideal triangles. So the, the, the order three symmetries uh, survive to the deformation. And what happens <clears throat> is that, as in the classical case, we have ST and TS, which are parabolic. But this time, I was saying here that the triple product, while well, it's square, is T inverse S, is a hyperbolic map. Here, in the complex hyperbolic case, I1, I2, I3 is parabolic. And the role of sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 in the classical case is played by I1, I2, I3 here. So this means that uh, T inverse S is parabolic. So we have deformed our function group so as to produce one new parabolic element. And if I take conjugates of T inverse S, I see that... Uh, so S inverse T... Uh, no, S inverse T is the same guy. So T S inverse, S T S, and T S T. All these guys are parabolic. And they are conjugate to the same, to the... Look, for instance, here. 
if I conjugate this guy by T inverse, then this is the same thing as T squared as T, and because T has order three, uh, oh, t, so, sorry, T minus squared, so this is the same thing as TST. Okay, so these guys are just uh, conjugates of the same element or its inverse. Okay, so I have more parabolics. Okay, so let me, now I'm going to state a theorem. Sorry for this somewhat technical interlude. So theorem. So I'm going to denote gamma 3, which is the group generated by st for a equals alpha 0. So in the last ideal triangle group, I take the group generated by the two order three symmetries. And then I'm going to uh, call lambda its limit set and omega is going to be the boundary of H2C minus the limit set. So what's omega? It's just as in the case of real hyperbolic space, omega is the discontinuity region at infinity. And now the theorem that Schwartz proved is that omega modded out by gamma 3 is homeomorphic to the whitehead link complement. Okay, so uh, this is a striking result. So let me try to explain you why. So I should name this after Schwartz. So here are a few remarks. First, a uh, first reason for which it is striking is that now, if you look, so at H2C mod gamma 3, this is a complex hyperbolic manifold. That's just a definition uh, because it's a quotient of the complex hyperbolic space. Is a complex hyperbolic manifold. Now, if you look at omega mod gamma 3, as I said, this is the whitehead link complement. And the whitehead link complement is one of the simplest examples of a real hyperbolic manifold. So that's at least a nice object. We have a complex hyperbolic manifold whose boundary at infinity is a real hyperbolic manifold. At the time, so th this happened around 2000, say, at the time, it wasn't known if it, was, if it was possible to produce such a thing. Okay? So let me just give you a few examples of manifolds that can arise as boundary at infinity of complex hyperbolic uh, manifolds. So, simpler examples. So, let's start with just one simple group generated by a loxodromic element. So that's just a cyclic group. Okay? So we're in this situation. I have a loxodromic element, and I'm only considering 
the action of this loxodromic element on S3. Okay? But still, I can take a fundamental domain for its action in H2C and intersect it with H3. And so, what's the inter so this is a hypersurface of, no, sorry, I won't explain this to you like that. Sorry, that's not a... Okay, we consider the action of this element on, S on S3. So what I do is I want to see S3 as R3 with a point at infinity. Okay, and the point at infinity is going to be the fixed point, one of the two fixed points of my isodromic element. So it's like this. This is infinity, and this is zero. So if we compare with what we saw yesterday, this is the origin of the Heisenberg group, and this is the point at infinity of the Heisenberg group. And this loxodromic element in Heisenberg coordinates acts as this, zt, is mapped to lambda z, lambda squared t. So it multiplies z by some complex factor, and t, which is the height here, by the modulus squared of this factor. Okay? Now, if you look at what happens under this action, if you take a sphere somewhere here, and you take its image under this action, you get a dilated sphere. Well, it's actually not a Euclidean, or, well, uh, a fine dilation, because it has a square, but still it's a sphere, and you can identify this first sphere to the second one by the, by the, the loxodromic element. And what you get is, well, if you take a point here and a point there that are identified, this segment here is going to become a loop in the quotient. And what you get is S2 cross S1. So uh, if I look at the boundary at infinity of H2C, modded out by the group generated by uh, a loxodromic element, what you see is S2, sorry, S2 cross S1. So that's a Hopf manifold. So this is the simplest example. Now, what happens if you replace the If you replace this loxodromic element with an elliptic element of finite order, so as to be uh, able to make the quotient, so if lox is replaced with elliptic of finite order, then what you get is what's called a lens space. So what is it? You have two orthogonal complex lines that live inside H2C, and we have the boundary S3. And the, the elliptic element is going to rotate because it has finite order. Well, I, I won't take any loxodromic of finite order. I'm, I'm going to be slightly more specific. So I'm going to have two rotation angles. So the rotation angles are 2 pi over p and 2 pi q over p, or some p and q in z, which want to be co-prime. Uh, OK, well, that's the definition of a lens space. If you mod out S3 by the action of this, well, you get that's a lens space. OK, and there are a few examples like this. So let me, so these were just cyclic group. Let me just show you what happens if you, if you look at the surface groups. So let's take a, a surface group. Consider gamma uh, G, a surface group. preserving 
a complex line. So we have a, a surface group that preserve the complex line. So I'm going to denote this line L. And the action of gamma G on the complex line has a fundamental domain. I'm thinking of a closed surface, but this works as well for non-compact ones. And then above each point here, just like yesterday, we have an orthogonal complex line. Okay, so we have disk here cross disk there. Okay, and if you intersect this with the boundary, what you see is disk cross S1, the boundary of this circle here. So the, the quotient in that case, sorry, in that case, uh, omega mod gamma g is a circle bundle over uh, sigma g. Okay? So there's been a lot of uh, questions raised about which bundles you can obtain. Uh, there are lots of topological invariants that have been studied. In general, these bundles are not trivial. It was a big question to know if you can produce a trivial bundle or not. And uh, it's been answered by the affirmative, but I don't go into this. But, uh, okay, that's the kind of object that you get. The point is, so that's a three manifold, okay? We have a circle bundle over sigma g. This is never hyperbolic, okay? And all these examples had been produced, and it still it was unknown if you could manage so as to obtain uh, a real hyperbolic manifold uh, doing this. And so that's what Schwartz did. So uh, the countdown telling me 12. So in the 12 me remaining minutes, I just would like to give you a, a, a flavor of what he did to, to prove that. Sorry? 17. Oh, because it doesn't go all the way. Oh. Well, the flavor would be maybe slightly more flavored or maybe slightly more spicy, which is kind of fair. Uh, okay, so what am I going to erase? Uh, this I want to keep. This I want to keep. So I come here. So, uh, so what is the Whitehead link complement, by the way? <laughs> I should have drawn one maybe before. Remark. So the Whitehead link complement, so Whitehead link, well, well, this is the scary moment for me. Okay, this is the whitehead link, and the whitehead link complement is everything that's around it in S3. Okay, whitehead link complement. So I'm going to de denote it by WLC. Okay, so the fact, the initial fact is that this is a hyperbolic manifold. So what do I mean by that? So this is a three-dimensional hyperbolic manifold. So I'm claiming that there exists a lattice in PSL2C which is the group of orientation preserving of H3R. Uh, such that the whitehead link complement is uh, H3R 
modded out by, so this lattice is going to be, I'm going to denote it by gamma. Uh, H3R mod gamma. So, in fact, uh, this quotient here, well, that's given by the lattice condition with finite volume. So, uh, moreover, this lattice is almost unique. It's unique up to conjugation. This is due to Mostow's theorem. So, gamma is unique up to conjugation. Okay, and what else can I say? Oh yes, for fun, let me just give you the pi one of of this uh, of this object. So pi one of WLC is this. Uh, you take U and V, so as an abstract group, so that U V U V inverse. U inverse, V inverse, and U inverse, V. Okay? So this is the fundamental group of the uh, Whitehead link complement, and the lattice here is isomorphic to this thing here. So you have two elements and make the product of these two commutators, and you get one. Okay, and a gamma here can be taken a subgroup of finite index of PSL2 Z of I. Now, the problem is, how can one construct a whitehead link complement by hand, concretely? Because if we want to say that the... Uh, uh, it's kind of... <laughs> How can I run out of place on such a long board? So how can we construct a, 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 a whitehead link complement using... A... Okay, so the thing is, well, you can do it using a, an octahedron and identification of faces. Okay, so let me just draw an octahedron for you. Okay, so this is an octahedron only after a uh, stereographic projection. So if you think of the usual version of the octahedron, this point here is mapped to infinity. This point here is mapped to zero. And then you see that we have four edges emanating from zero. I draw them like this. And then we have four edges emanating from infinity. And these are, these edges. So it's just a, I'm taking this octahedron and I flatten, in, flatten it like this so as to obtain this picture. Yes, I'm doing stereographic projection. And now there is a way of gluing the faces of this thing so, so as to obtain a, a whitehead link complement. So I'm going to draw these identifications, even though it's not extremely relevant for today. Uh, uh, sorry. Now, if you look at it carefully, long enough, you will see that there, is an, uh, there are identification among faces. I'm going to come to this in, in one second. But, and the quotient is the weighted link complement. Now, okay, 
So, sorry, the quotient is not exactly the whitehead link complement. The quotient of this thing to which you remove the vertices. Yes? So, <laughs> there are two options. Either you're Thurston and you just see it, or you spent a few hours on, on his book where uh, <laughs> a few hours, I said, <laughs> it goes up to 20, say. After 20, it's like, a, a <laughs> OK, <laughs> well, I guess I'll let you guess which option I, I chose. <laughs> uh, uh, OK, uh, and so if you identify, uh, so for instance, let me, this face here, A, is identified to that face here, A prime. Here I'm going to have C and C prime, B prime and B, and D and D prime. If I have this combinatorial da data, then I get exactly what I need. That's a white headling complement. So I'm not claiming this is at all trivial. This is not something I can, I mean, you have to, if you wish to understand it, you need to, to sweat on it. That's a... Uh, I don't know, uh, it, it's terrible for me. I, I'm still not quite convinced it is true, but uh, I must... <laughs> okay, but yes? Sorry? No, the, I, I'm, okay, okay, sorry. The, I'm taking a solid octahedron here, and here I'm taking the part of, that lies above the, the board. Sorry, I should have said that more clearly. Okay, so when I do stereographic projection here, what's inside the octahedron uh, uh, becomes what's in the room. Okay, Norbert <laughs> told us about the room next door, but <laughs> okay. And what uh, Rich Schwartz noticed is that each time you have a Z3 free product with Z3, then you get uh, such a, a combinatorics. So, what I'm going to do is to label uh, these vertices here with fixed points of parabolic isometries in the last ideal triangle groups. So, you remember there were ST and TS, as well as S inverse T and some conjugates. So, what appears is this. So I need my paper, otherwise. The point at infinity here is the fixed point of TS. Okay? Well, okay, P sub something means fixed point of the something. And because I'm only having parabolic elements, they have a unique fixed point, so it's non-ambiguous. Okay, the central element, the central vertex is P, S, T. Now, I'm going to have P, T, S, T, P, T, S inverse, P, S, T, S, and P, uh, oh, S inverse T. Okay. Now, what you need to do to verify this is to check, well, you can check, for instance, one identification of, of faces. Mm. <laughs> yes, here it is. So, for instance, to verify this, you can check then ST, S inverse T, and STS is mapped to TS, STS, and TS inverse. And this operation here is conjugation by S inverse. Okay? So if you conjugate all these three elements by S inverse, then you get these three elements, and these two pairs are faces in there. So it's just to tell you how this uh, identifications appear. So what I've said to you up to now is just combinatorics, okay? This you can do, it's just 
is just combinatorial. What Schwartz did is proving that you could actually realize this octahedron inside the boundary of, uh, of complex hyperbolic space, realize the faces, fill it in, which is not at all trivial, and on the contrary, it's highly technical. It's a, it's a, very, a very complicated proof. And eventually, you get to the point where he showed that he could actually mod out the discontinuity region by this identification and get a, a, an octahedron like this that would tessellate the discontinuity region. So, uh, and that was back in, in 2000. So, let me just give you an idea of what happened next, because some things happened since then. So, when they saw this, people thought, that's a nice structure. So we need to find out uh, if we can find more of them. Here is a, a question. What hyperbolic knot can you do the same with? Can you do this with, the, for instance, a figure eight knot, which is another simple hyperbolic uh, knot? And so... Uh, You can. So, uh, conclusion. What other hyperbolic manifold can you get? So, the figure eight knot has been done. by De Rho and Falbel. Then De Rho proved that you could actually deform these structures, keeping such a, a spherical CR uniformization, because that's the name of this thing. And, uh, well, there's been another such structure described on the Whitehead link complement by John Parker and myself. And one of the questions is that um, when you want to describe such structures, you have to find what's called a holonomy morphism from the fundamental group of your manifold here, the Whitehead link complement, to the group that you're considering. So here, PU21. And if you want to find representations of this thing here into PU21, then, well, that's not something you want to do too often, right? Because you have to solve these polynomial equations in the, in the group, and this is very difficult. So there's been a program uh, when I'm saying program, not a computer program, a general uh, work frame, say, <laughs> to, to try to find the representations of uh, fundamental groups of three manifolds into PU21, PGL3, PGLNC, all these higher groups uh, than PSL2C. And, well, this is an on ongoing story. In that case, what I was saying is that, uh, in fact, and that will be my, my conclusive remark. Uh, uh, Z3 free product with Z3 is a quotient of I1 of the Whitehead link complement. And so the holonomy representation is just this Z3 cross Z3. And uh, and that's it. I think I'm going to stop here. But before that, I would like to thank uh, the organizers because uh, they've done a great job. And uh, uh, thank you very much for having me among you. <laughs>